Good morning, church. It's good to be with all of you. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, it means a lot that we have this medium to, to be able to connect with one another, even if uh, it's a different way of connecting. It means a lot to me, at least. So I, I appreciate you taking the time and, uh, and keeping that time on Sunday morning or whenever you tune into this uh, sacred. So I think that's, that's important in our lives. Uh, for many, it's a way for us to remember what day of the week all the other days are uh, because we do stop and take a deep breath on Sunday uh, as the days run together. But, uh, but we are together through all of this, and, and I hope that uh, continues to be felt. Uh, I, uh, again, encourage you, if you need anything, uh, please let us know. You can call, email, or uh, text me, uh, or any of the vestry members or staff members, and um, uh, and I continue to urge all of you to reach out just a little bit further each each week, maybe one or two uh, new people that uh, that you just give a call to to see how they're doing. And, uh, and any creative ideas, uh, and I'm not the most creative, but I've been in, uh, impressed with folks like Amber who've offered to make masks and all the people that have taken her up on that. Uh, if you need a mask, uh, please do the same. Uh, call, text, or, or email me. Um, and if you think of any other ways that we can uh, help one another, uh, do so, please do so. Please consider being part of one of the smaller groups uh, that are meeting either to uh, discuss adult formation, which they're now on the second chapter of, of Borg's book, Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time, or Thursday Morning, or uh, any other group that are uh, getting together. So uh, consider that as well. And, and know that it's not too late to jump on board uh, the adult ed uh, discussion group. Uh, just let uh, Jim or Alice know, and there's details in your Thursday email. Uh, also, we're going to be posting videos uh, to sort of guide the conversation and guide your uh, walk through that book. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to doing that as well. Um, other things going on, um, people have asked uh, about the day-by-day -day booklets. I'm so glad that so many people use that resource. So far, uh, they have not come into the church. We do have the large uh, print uh, version of the of the next series, but uh, uh, but the smaller books have not come in yet. But you can go online, just Google forward day by day, uh, and follow uh, on your computer uh, until until that happens. And uh, one of the other things that I just recommend um, share uh, share ideas uh, and and things that maybe have inspired you or you found helpful. Uh, I would love to post them on our weekly email, whether it's a, a little bit of levity, uh, clean preferably, um, a, a book you're reading that's been inspiring, uh, a daily uh, blog, uh, just something that, that you think might be helpful to other people that, uh, that's helped you along the way. Uh, and, uh, and just know that we continue to pray for one another and lift each other up. And, uh, uh, and we're glad you're here this morning. So with that, we make our Easter song. We begin with our opening acclamation. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord has risen indeed. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hi, everyone. Happy third Sunday of Easter 2020. It's Norma Thatcher coming to you by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the power of a video recording to give the prayers of the people for today's service. I miss each one of you. And I can hardly wait till we can get back to worship again together. Brother Ben encouraged me to write my own prayers for today, and so I did. I decided to pray outside since today, the day I'm recording, is Earth Day. And that way you can enjoy the beauty of God's creation. Let us lift up to God our worries and concerns. Heavenly Father, we know that living a life of fear is not what you intend for us, your children. When we focus on scarcity, we miss the abundance that is ours. Please ease our worries and concerns about our health, our finances, our very way of life. Fill us with your peace and assurance that you are in control that life goes according to your plan, 
that all is well. Let us lift up to God those for whom our prayers have been asked. Please pray for Steve, Bonnie, Omni, Christine, Steve, Judy, John, Tom, Joan, Kay, Allison, Rick, Ansel, Tina, Linda, Fred, Kay, Doug, Ed, Peter, and Marie. And for those deployed members of the military and their families, especially Conrad, Maria, and Mark. And we pray for those in prison, in hospital, in nursing homes, in hospice, those struggling with any addiction, the hungry, the sick, and those who are alone. And in a moment of silence, for all those whose names are on our own hearts, Let us lift up to God our grief and sorrow. During this isolated time when friends and loved ones have died and were unable to hold funerals and memorial services, and also unable to experience the physical, personal physical and empathic comfort of others, our sorrow and aloneness can seem overwhelming. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with each person who is grieving. Comfort them. May they find consolation in knowing that those we miss are with you and are at peace. Let us lift up to God our praise and our thanks. Heavenly Father, we have so much to be thankful for. For all the first responders, the nurses, doctors, EMTs, and firefighters, everyone on that front line of fighting this virus. And for all the people who make it possible for us to have food and necessities, the farmers, the manufacturers, the truck drivers, the grocery and drugstore workers, everyone in that supply chain. We thank you for the kindness and compassion experienced here in our own community and in communities throughout the world. We praise you, God, for a time of the Earth's healing. We thank you for the creativity and perseverance of those working toward finding solutions and vaccines. Heavenly Father, bless each one of us. May we be messengers of love and hope and healing to those who need us, to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, Amen. And I say again, Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John. Now on that same day, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. 
Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I've had a lot more time at home in recent weeks, and uh, in having that opportunity, uh, I've also been able to watch my children a little bit more uh, during the day and how they rise to meet the day. Uh, and it is not a swift action by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and it doesn't happen at the, uh, at the break of dawn either. Uh, they would not have been there with the woman at the tomb. Uh, this happened several hours later, uh, and I go up to, to wake them up, and uh, the first invitation to meet the day is, uh, is totally rebuffed. Uh, the second might draw at least a little movement, maybe uh, a head bob uh, and a look to the left and right, um, unimpressed, and then, uh, and then back to the pillow, uh, retreating sort of like the groundhog does. Um, and then maybe the third time, uh, They'll wake up and they'll come downstairs, and I'm always impressed that they seem to come to whatever room I'm in, uh, and I think it's because they want to start their day with some wisdom from Dad, um, and they sit down, and um, I get ready to engage them, and then I realize that uh, their eyes are focused on something well beyond this dimension in time, that they are not... Um, at least they're physically present, but that's the only part of them that's really there in the moment. And any attempt that I make uh, to raise uh, my, my voice, to, uh, uh, to, to show some of the energy of the cups of coffee that I've already had uh, that day uh, are, are quickly rebuffed. Uh, they're not ready to meet the here and now. They're not ready for the reality of this day. Uh, they're still coming into it. Uh, and you know what? I think that is how most of us encounter Easter or, uh, or God's grace, uh, that our eyes are not immediately receptive to it, uh, that we don't wake up to it uh, right away. It's certainly been the stories uh, that we've been, been hearing. And much like Epiphany is that season uh, where we realize that it wasn't just that God came into the world in human form, uh, but that people encountered it and it changed their lives. Easter season is not just about proclaiming that the tomb is empty, uh, but trusting that truth and making that truth our foundation uh, and experiencing it for ourselves. Uh, and we start with Mary on that Easter morning, uh, who wasn't immediately uh, brought to the fullness of joy. Uh, in fact, the chaos of the moment, the grief she was already experiencing, the anger that she had, all culminated in her being unable to really uh, fully understand the moment. And even uh, when the gardener, uh, Jesus, says, Mary, 
Uh, even that uh, is, is a rushed moment where she holds on, uh, trying to, to, to savor this Easter moment uh, where she's sent out uh, to go and tell others. And I think it probably were, was days and days of, of really uh, pondering what it means um, that, that Easter began to wash over her, that she began to be able uh, to be the instrument uh, of grace and light and joy that, um, that Easter calls us to be. Uh, and certainly Thomas, uh, he heard the news. Um, he'd heard from, from his closest disciples, from the followers of Jesus, uh, that, um, that, that Jesus was alive, but it wasn't enough. Uh, until he experienced it, until he encountered uh, God alive again, uh, he wouldn't give his whole life, his whole being over to it. And, uh, and today we have another story of, of people coming to Jesus, uh, coming to the truth and to the light and to the, uh, the owning internally of what it is uh, to have experienced that Christ is indeed alive, that Christ is risen, uh, that the power of God is greater than the, uh, the forces that corrupt and destroy the creatures of God. Uh, but it wasn't an easy process for these two men. Um, and I invite you to follow me a little bit as we walk uh, as they walked. Uh, this is the return journey, probably a week after uh, they first made it to Jerusalem. And, uh, and when they went to Jerusalem, uh, they were going as faithful Jews, uh, they were going as followers of Jesus, and they were probably filled uh, with excitement, filled uh, with the possibility that, uh, that this would be an incredible spiritual uh, transformative moment for them. Not only was this when they came to celebrate the most uh, holiest of times in the, in the, in the Jewish year, uh, where they gathered with so many other who, others who made pilgrimage to come to the, uh, the temple. Uh, but it was also a time when Jesus was coming in Jerusalem and anything was possible. In fact, even the way Jesus entered into Jerusalem, uh, just seemed to, to, to open to them the possibility of anything, uh, that they could leave Jerusalem, uh, victors, uh, that, uh, that the world may have told them again and again that they always lose, uh, but that they understood God's dream for them. And maybe this, uh, this Passover, uh, they left believing that that dream was theirs. Um, uh, they had this person, uh, this God uh, person that they didn't quite fully understand, but they knew that this person was of God. Uh, this person had a dream uh, that most clearly was God's dream. This person had the capacity to heal uh, and to do things that they'd never seen before. Uh, and the words that he spoke seemed so true, so true uh, that it just must be from God. And so as he came in uh, riding on a donkey like a, a king just for them, uh, a king dressed as they'd be dressed, uh, honoring uh, their their lives uh, without all the regalia that, that they'd never seen in theirs. Um, as he came into Jerusalem during this Passover celebration, everything seemed possible. Um, and then they watched as the days transpired. Uh, they watched as, uh, as the leaders of their faith uh, uh, colluded with the leaders of Rome uh, and arrested Jesus. They saw a sham trial that led to, uh, to Jesus being tortured. Uh, and they saw in the way that Jesus was not just tortured, but ridiculed, embarrassed, shamed on the cross. Uh, I imagine shame started to fill them. Shame on them for believing that anything was possible. Shame on them for believing uh, that they could triumph uh, that the powers of this uh, world could be brought down. Shame on them for trusting uh, that things would be different. Uh, and with every scourge, I imagine a little bit of that hope, a little bit of that light and fire left them. Uh, but they didn't leave. Uh, they stayed. They stayed all the way to the end. Uh, even after Jesus died and was taken off the cross, they stayed. I don't know why they stayed. Maybe, uh, maybe they still had just enough light, just enough hope in them uh, that something was possible. This is the one who raised Lazarus from the dead. Uh, anything was possible, but they stuck around all the way until that third day. Uh, that third day meant something. You know, when somebody was dead for three days, they didn't come back. Uh, 
there was something permanent, uh, something extinguishing about being there on the third day. Even as they heard the news that the tomb was empty, uh, even as they heard accounts from the women uh, that Jesus was alive, that an angel had told them that Jesus was alive, uh, they even had enough faith to, to go and look for Jesus, but when they didn't find him, there was nothing left, just gray and black where there had been a bright red orange. Um, it had been extinguished, and they walked home. And I can only imagine uh, slumped over uh, walking together, uh, what it must have been like, sharing the stories of um, of what they expected, what they hoped for, what had happened, all of the speculation. Could they trust any of it? Uh, where were they going to go besides home? And uh, at least at home, um, with lower expectations, uh, they could control um, their little circle. Uh, and, and I imagine that was what they were discussing. We'll just go home. It's not that bad. We can get through this. You know, and then somebody comes and joins them. And the somebody is entirely unrecognizable to him. Uh, and he also seems like he must uh, have existed under a rock uh, for the last week at least because he knows nothing of what has taken place. Uh, and as they look at the risen Lord, uh, they don't recognize him, just like Mary didn't recognize him. Uh, and it begs the question, uh, is this because Jesus look drastically different in the risen form? Uh, or is this about us and our receptivity? Uh, I'd like to think it is a statement about all of us uh, that if we don't have Easter eyes, uh, we don't see Easter. Uh, if we don't have eyes that anticipate God doing incredible things, we don't see God doing incredible things. Uh, I think that there is something intentional uh, about Jesus being difficult uh, to identify, uh, especially for these folks who are dealing with that huge pall, that cloud of grief, uh, of, 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 of just sorrow and pain uh, and disillusionment, that all of that, like a cloud that comes over uh, and blocks the sun uh, and casts such a uh, overwhelming shadow on a sunny day, keeps you from realizing that it is sunny out. Uh, I think that um, that all that they were experiencing uh, blinded them to the fact that Jesus was with them. I also think Luke is really intentional here. Uh, Luke invites all of us uh, to think about how we might be blind, uh, how God might be walking right beside, beside us. And because we're not wearing Easter eyes, uh, because we're not open uh, to the possibility that God is right there, uh, we're missing it, uh, and that God is that palpably, that viscerally, that truly right at hand, uh, and we miss it. I think Luke invites us uh, into this Emmaus, Emmaus walk as we try to understand uh, how, how God might be with us uh, and what might keep us from, from trusting that. Uh, I think that's particularly relevant uh, given all that we're dealing with right now, that, uh, um, that we're invited to ask ourselves, where is it that we're blind to God who is with us, walking with us, especially uh, amidst the grief and chaos and confusion of our darkest hours? Uh, I definitely, uh, definitely connected with that. Uh, and then uh, this stranger, this, uh, this person who's walking with these two uh, begins to take the events of the last couple days, the events that, that tore their heart out uh, and turn them upside down. Uh, he says, doesn't this all make sense? Think of your story. Uh, and remember that uh, the Jews of that time would have known their story meticulously well. They didn't have Netflix and all the other things that you may have discovered in the last several weeks to pass the time. Uh, they knew in and out uh, the story of, of Scripture. Uh, it was their story. It was the story of their ancestors. Uh, and they understood it. And so when Jesus opened it up in this beautiful way that allowed them to see uh, that what appeared to be the tragedy and devastation uh, of the last week uh, was part of God's hand uh, fulfilling all of their hopes, uh, giving them uh, new life, redeeming 
all humanity. Uh, it was part of God meeting God's promise to all of them. Uh, and imagine uh, how having uh, God himself opening all of that up uh, would, have, would, have, would have been an incredible experience. In fact, uh, I can only say that I would, I would love uh, that to happen in our, in our lives, to have God just sort of paint our picture, paint the story of our lives, uh, 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 and have it grafted to all of the stories that have gone before us in a way where we get to see God's hand and God's redemptive story taking place amidst it. Uh, because I think way too often uh, we look at, at, at the world and we look at our lives uh, with the farthest thing from Easter eyes. Uh, so to have God um, open it up uh, and for us to realize what we have just experienced, what we are experiencing uh, is part of God's still unfolding story uh, would be incredibly beautiful, incredibly life-giving, uh, hopeful and sustaining. Uh, but even then, uh, these two uh, aren't able uh, to put on Easter eyes. That ember, uh, as much as it's, as it's been breathed over uh, and into, it still hasn't caught fire. Um, but the story keeps going. And so Jesus uh, is prepared to, to, to keep on walking uh, on as they turn off to go home. Uh, and they reach out to him. They call him and they say, uh, Sir, uh, come to our house. Uh, come, it's late. Uh, you, can, you can make your way uh, wherever you're going tomorrow. Uh, just come home with us and, uh, and we'll give you a place to stay. Uh, and it's when he's in the house uh, and he takes the bread. And he blesses the bread. And he breaks the bread that all of a sudden they see. They see what's been right in front of them their whole, their whole journey. Uh, they see uh, why their hearts have been afire uh, this whole time. Uh, that God was with them. Uh, and that gray, uh, dusty ember is now burning bright red and orange. Uh, and they know that God is with them. Uh, and that God has prevailed, and that hope is still in the universe, uh, and that Easter has happened for them, uh, just as it happened for the women who experienced the empty tomb. Uh, and in that moment, um, uh, they become uh, not just uh, followers of Jesus, uh, but they become uh, the fathers of the church. Uh, they go back and they tell the disciples, and they become part uh, of, of, of what draws us here amidst this quarantine uh, to tune into our televisions or our iPhones or our computers uh, to get a, uh, a little bit of that ember that, uh, uh, that caught fire in them. Um, and I have to tell you that the, that part, that moment, uh, has sit heavily with me. Uh, that, that phrase that, uh, that when he took, blessed, and broke the bread, that they knew, um, and so much of it points to uh, what we've been deprived of for the last seven weeks, uh, usually four times a week at least, uh, and sometimes several times more in people's houses and uh, at, at special events, uh, we break bread together. And it's not just the bread and the wine, uh, but it is God's promise to be present in that and in the gathered family that, that, that gathers to, to share that Eucharistic meal together that... Um, that it's been so easy to see God in the midst of, um, uh, of that moment. Uh, and it sort of struck me of, of, as to how much I long for that, uh, how much I've missed it. Uh, but I don't think that for those two people who came to see in that moment uh, that it was much about uh, the weekly gathering of the Eucharist that hadn't even been established yet. Uh, and they probably weren't at that uh, that special meal that Jesus had prepared for those closest to him, uh, that Passover meal, they might have heard about it. Um, but maybe they did have an opportunity to break bread with Jesus. Uh, and maybe that's when they felt that God was with them, that they were important, that God uh, was willing uh, to be with them at table fellowship, which meant they mattered. Or maybe they were there uh, in that moment of scarcity when all was, were hungry and it was getting late and the words of Jesus were just too much to retreat from. Uh, and so they stayed hour after hour as their stomachs growled uh, and there was just 
no food uh, and somehow Jesus took a few loaves uh, and, a, and a few fishes and he took the bread uh, and he asked God's blessing upon the bread and he broke the bread and he gave it to them and there was enough food for everybody. Maybe it recalled that moment and maybe that moment was the moment uh, that they began to believe that that ember started to burn. Um, whatever it is, uh, it is a reminder that God is with us. Uh, and even though, uh, for me, the first experience might have been the pangs of, of realizing uh, how much I miss gathering at table together with all of you, uh, how much I miss meeting God in, in, in the Eucharist and the bread and the wine, uh, maybe it was a reminder of more than that, of what came before uh, the Eucharist, uh, that God continue to reach out and maybe the reason that they had faith, uh, the reasons that they were followers, uh, was that the bread represented that God was with them, that God sat with them and dined with them and that their lives mattered uh, and that God met them where they were, whether on the road, uh, whether in an empty clearing um, by the sea uh, or at their dinner, dinner table. God met them where they needed uh, to be met by God, to know that they mattered and that God was in their lives and that God was working in and through them. And so I hear the same thing I heard last week. Church happens because God meets people where they are and gives them what they need so that they can go out and be the church. So again, as has happened every single week since we've had to broadcast uh, from different places uh, into people's living rooms, God meets us where we are. God gives us what we need. God assures us that God is with us. And so I hope, while our embers are all apart, that this keeps us burning bright with the knowledge that God is with us and that we can see with Easter eyes that Christ is risen, hope is alive. Amen. Hello. I will be singing hymn 686, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Happy Sunday. Hey. Maisie, get your tongue out of my ear. <laughs> we Happy Easter to everybody. We love you and miss you all and wish you peace and health and happiness. And uh, we'll all see each other very, very soon. Yes, we look forward to that day. Absolutely. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. <laughs> Amen and hallelujah. Amen. Amen and hallelujah. Remember that life is short.
We have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who traveled the way with us. So be quick to be kind, make haste to love, and the blessing of God Almighty, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. Our worship is now ended, and our service in the world begins. Let us go forth to proclaim that Christ is risen. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia. We miss you, St. James. Stay strong, everyone.